crap. Okay. Sorry. All right, guys. Uh, I, uh, Frank Bryant, Medicare Guru site here, here uh, coming to you live uh, from our conference room here on our beautiful sales floor in Cedar Park. Um, as you can tell, I still have uh, Stephen Grip and Jacob Crotty with me today. We'll have more people coming in and out as the uh, hour progresses. Uh, as always, we're an active sales floor. So uh, even myself will get pulled out of here to go close the deal. So uh, bear with us on that. And also, uh, just a little quick revamp. These conversations are just conversations. They're open format. We're here to talk sales and only sales, uh, training, stuff like that. Um, uh, uh, but we're really providing good insight and uh, solutions for problems. So let us help you work it out uh, and you know see how we work it out. So um, with that, let's open it up, man. What do, what do you guys got for me today? I got something today. What do you got? Getting a little deep. Uh, we had a conversation yesterday, and I thought it would be cool to bring it up today to talk about it. We were talking yesterday about uh, getting into a call and understanding the concept of fear of loss versus opportunity to gain. Mm -hmm. And we talked about which is weightier when you're talking to somebody. So uh, yesterday I had a call, and <clears throat> this person had an opportunity to gain, you know, improve their benefits and had everything set up and they're like, I don't want to change. I, I'm happy where I'm at. And I just felt like no matter how well I explained it, they just weren't hearing me. And so we talked about it and you said, well, was there anything that they were losing? Did you express that there was that they were losing out on benefits? I said, I didn't take that angle at all. I was trying to show opportunity to gain. And you said, well, fear of loss always trumps opportunity to gain. So I wanted to talk about that. All right. Well, I mean, how deep do you all want to go on that? Because that goes into neurochemistry <laughs> and evolution. I mean, it can go, it can go, it can go, we can go super geek with that. Go ahead, Darwin. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Call your bluff here. Let's go. Adi, 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 adi over here. Just kidding me. So, all right. Um, all right. So human beings share uh, certain components of the brain and their decision process with every other really multi-celled animal, and that's because that's the one thing that really lets evolution happen is how do you stay alive long enough to procreate? So, you know, it's a matter of sentience is being able to uh, feel the and, and, and interact with the environment around you, right? So that means you got to feel stuff. you got to feel pain. you got to be afraid of dying. you got to do all this other stuff. So that's right in the center of your brain called the amygdala, right? And this is the reason why a basic lizard, that's why they also call it the lizard brain, the can make decisions, you know, don't jump into a fire, don't fly off a cliff if you can't fly, right? You know, all these other things. So that's all stemmed from fear. So basically all decisions, since we know animals that aren't really cognizant or sapient, they can, they can make decisions. So how does that happen? Well, we make decisions too, so we share that. So most decisions are fear-based. Right. So fear of loss is an incredibly powerful motivator for both inaction and action. So if someone like that lady was saying, I don't want to lose, uh, I think it was Humana, correct? Humana, right? Humana. I don't want to lose Humana. I don't want to lose Humana. But I want all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, you said, well, here's all this stuff. Right. It's just with Aetna. Right. And she goes, I want to lose Humana. Wait, but this has everything and more than what you want. Right. Don't want to lose Humana. Don't want to lose Humana. So you go, okay, well, we got to rephrase that. We got to switch the program on. It has to be, since you are motivated, and that's your that's way you make decisions, is a fear of loss and avoidance of the pain of loss. Right? We got to re, we got to, we got to do that part of the shift. We have to make you change your mental dynamic. So it's not an opportunity to get these extra things. It is you already should be getting these extra things. You are losing these benefits by not taking advantage of this. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Yeah. So that triggers another thing, which the opposite of fear of loss is fear of missing out, which is just losing an opportunity. Yeah. So you go, okay, well, you are losing these benefits by not acting. You haven't done it. So, I mean, and that's the only thing I can think of to do on that situation. And then, I mean, Here's the funny thing, if you pay attention, they literally tell you what motivates them. I don't want to lose my humana benefit. Yeah. Because humana, she, uh, how, she, 10 years. Know, 10 years, okay. 10 years. She got up late. Yeah, so. I think you back off that, that was the one that me and Kim had that I was helping her with this morning where the lady calls in and <clears throat> she's in Michigan 
and she has a I forgot, I think it's like Meridian mm -hmm. uh, plan with her Medicare and Medicaid. And come to find out, that's a state plan that they just put her on. Mm -hmm. And she started that conversation with, I just, before we go into anything, I don't want to change. I don't, and we said, fine, I don't want to change you. Mm -hmm. But we need to see what you have. Because for her, her, her big thing was she has like an aide coming to the house that's helping her out. She's in a wheelchair too. Mm -hmm. But through all the talking, you know, we're saying, well, we can see, but I don't want to change anything right now. Her big thing was, I'm afraid to go off of Meridian. Mm -hmm. So for her, we had to kind of break it down and say, look, the way your plan is operating, Meridian is just a gatekeeper. That's all they are. The state of Michigan is paying for your health care. The reason that you have free medications and no copays or anything when you go to the doctor, it's not because of Meridian, it's because of Michigan. And the state of Michigan puts you on that plan. Now you have an option to choose what plan you want, but everything works the same. So for her, we kind of had to take that same, her fear was losing. Mm -hmm. And I did the exact same thing that to where she says, you know, I don't want to change, I don't want to change. Well, you've been in this plan for four years. For the past four years, you've lost benefits that you don't even know exist because that's not a public plan. Right. <clears throat> Which one are you losing less with? Yeah. <clears throat> and by not moving, you're losing a lot more. Well, that's an easy decision at that point. That's a triage call on their point. So if you, if, by the way, it's not always fear of loss, right? People have different things that motivate them, different fears that actually drive them to the action. Some people are highly opportunistic and want to be fear of missing out. Some people are fear of loss. Some people, like a life injury or Medicare supplement clients, they fear a loss of freedom. They fear being taken advantage of. They fear all of these other things. And that's what they're telling you by saying, well, I want this. But what you're really telling me is that you don't want X. Guys, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to direct it toward you because you talk to clients like this. I mean, you've been with the clients many years. Talking to those clients that have been on F for a very long time, they have ingrained in their brain that F is the best plan, and I know that I have to pay for that plan F. So what is your fear of loss strategy or what is your strategies to conduct with the client when they are you know, paying a lot for plan F and you know you can save them a significant amount of money by going to a G? Well, you know, there's some age factors that get involved there too. Generally, when people get into their 80s or they've, they've had situations where they feel comfortable and they don't want to switch, I'm like, fine. We can keep you with the F. I always explain, you're going to hear a lot about Plan G. This is what it does, you know, but it's your decision. I still sell a lot of Plan Fs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Plan F is great. In fact, I prefer to sell a Plan F because I know they're not going to call me and ask me what these bills are about. Right. You know, <clears throat> but you have to let them make the decision. You know, you can, you can guide them in the right way, but... And it's a psychological game most of the time, but you can't force them and say, well, you should have done this. And, you know, all these things are available. Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you're not there yet. Typically at that stage in the conversation, you have to build all the trust and all that sort of thing and use third party references. Um, you know, that's very important. A lot of times when people have had to use the plan or need, like in this case you're talking about, they're already getting care. They don't want to mess with it. They're, they're afraid of loss. They're afraid they're going to lose their coverage. Some guy's calling me. He's trying to talk me into something. Um, you know, you've got a lot of trust building that has to be done there first before you can even get into that. But uh, <clears throat> I've had people that they're... They'll spend an extra, you know, thousand, two thousand dollars a year to keep that plan F, and um, yep. you know that's fine. I it mean, just depends on the person, uh, really. If you get if you get somebody who has who has been in the hospital quite a bit, and they've had you know throughout the years, yeah. to kind of like he was saying, with age is a big factor too. Yeah. So you get somebody who's sixty eight and perfectly healthy on a plan F that they're not really using. You can kind of say, hey, look, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because of how young you are and your health record versus if you're 86, 87 
and you've had a plan F for years, I'm not going to try to get you to a plan G because you're at that age to where you don't need to worry about this stuff anymore. And especially to, it's, for some people, it's the money, but I'd say 90, you'll probably back me up on this, 95% of the people, it's for the peace of mind. Mm -hmm. They will pay more to not pay anything at all. Mm -hmm. And they're fine with it. And those people, you don't necessarily want to change. It's just selector questions. You have to ask them the questions. I mean, if we always go, well, and this is the thing, we sometimes we're fighting battles we shouldn't be fighting. If people are happy and they're comfortable and they feel safe, which by the way, that's what insurance is. It is a promise to eliminate risk so that you feel safe and it will take it. By the way, it's there when it when you need it, it's there. That's the whole premise of it. It will take care of it. That's a safe feeling people buy. Otherwise, you know what? Everyone just be like, well, I'll just I'll put a million dollars in the bank. Right. I'll attach it to my 401k, whatever. Right. right? So the the concept of that is you know, we, we really rely heavily on selector questions here, and there's a reason for that. And you're saying specifically from an F to a G. Well, if I've already asked all this other stuff, I'm already turning them from a shopper into a buyer or someone placing an order. The questions that you look at change, right? If they're on an F plan and I know I can save them more money, I'm going to ask them the final question. Do you still like having everything just paid for automatically? Or if it saves you $1,000 a year to pay your doctor $233 when you first go, is that what you want to do? And they'll choose. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then that's it, right? But you got to put it in that prospect of this is, everyone understands that basic concept of business. You got to spend money to make money. Not always true, but it's one of those things that a lot of people that never been in business say, right? Guess what? You got to give them the option. It's an inconvenience to pay your doctor's office something. Not too much, just bring your card. But, you're paying for that inconvenience and that inconvenience is costing you X amount of dollars a year or sorry to have that X, uh, that inconvenience satisfied is covering that. Right. So you don't have to go into all of these extra explanations of this is the exact same thing, except for this, that confuses people. You have people go, Hey, do you want to continue to see your own doctor? Yes. Do you like your doctor? Yes. You want to keep on seeing them no matter what? Yes. If he recommends you to another doctor, do you want to go see another doctor or are you okay having an insurance company tell you what to do? I want to have the freedom to do it. I don't want to lose my freedom to do it. That's all selector questions are. They're a manifestation of scenarios where you go, hey, here's a pain point. Here's a pain point. Here's a pain point. Tell me and tell yourself that you don't want to have that pain point. And then doesn't matter what they say, whatever I come up next with is the exact solution for exactly what they told me. Doesn't matter. I could, I could be like, you know, here's a picture of a toucan that solves all your problems. I'd be like, yeah, that solves all my problems. Yeah. Um, well, I have, I've had success talking to FG is talking about the exchange. When I had somebody on an F, I'd always be like, well, do you know what a G is? And they're like, I don't really know what it is. Well, I say, well, in your situation, a G is an exchange. You are exchanging paying the 233 deductible, and in exchange, you get the savings from the G. And I would have the calculation of how much money you'd be getting back from the G. And in that way, they're not feeling like anything's changing. You're just exchanging. You're just trading in what you're paying for. And that's the essence of a Medicare supplement conversation is when you're talking about Medicare supplements, it's not a coverage conversation. It's a billing conversation. How would you like to be billed? Do you want to be paid 233 or do you want to save money? What do you want to do? You know? It comes down to, and it is, Plan G, I tell them, look, Plan G is not perfect. You, you're going to get some bills. You're going to have to cover that first 233. And and if you get hospitalized, they may not submit the stuff to Medicare for months. You see a subsequent doctor, they're going to say, well, you haven't met your Part B deductible. We went another 233. And, you know, seniors hate that stuff. Mm -hmm. They get supplemental plans because they don't get hassled. It's a, it's a turnkey thing. They go in. They don't have to worry about it. You know, they have to deal with cable companies and, you know, cell phone companies. We hate that stuff. Everybody does. They want simplicity. If they can afford the Plan F, they'll always go with the Plan F. Of course, and I'll you recommend know, they that. Will always, and I'll, I'll say thank you yeah. because 
that's easier on me because I get those calls all day long. I've got this bill and that bill, and lo and behold, they haven't met their part B deductible. That's what those bills are for. But hold on a second. <clears throat> when you say always, I mean, I think you're discounting a level of mastery that you have at this because look at the way you just described it yourself. And when you're giving them that either or proposition of is this worth $500 or $1,000 a year, it's a different conversation with you because your value proposition is different. You've been doing this a long time. You make a lot of money. That could be really worth it to you. But look at what you just said. It wasn't a matter of, and, the, and by the way, this is the lesson. It can be whatever you want it to be as an agent. You can tailor these conversations to come to the outcome that you want to come to. And in your value, you go, I'll just pay the F plan. So in your conversation is maybe five more selected questions. Hey, man, are you okay getting double billed every once in a while having a resolution? Because that could right. be a pain. They go, no. Okay. Is this, and then you go, so all of these things is not worth $500 a year to you. And they'll go, no. I mean, that's the whole thing is that it doesn't have to be the, I mean, you're just, and that's one of the things. It's like, they, they don't always choose that. They always choose it because you're really good at your job. <laughs> that's the point. You well, know? I do try to, well, I want them to be, and it, it comes down to questioning. You have to ask the questions, what do they want to do? What, what's important to them? Now, it's state specific. Some states are looking at seven, eight hundred dollars a month or a year of difference in premium. It's a no brainer. I mean, you, that, there's too much money on the table. Right. And plan F is not feasible. But when you're only looking at 50 or 100 dollars, you know, that you're going to pay for this. Uh, plan F is, is pretty darn attractive. But you shouldn't make that call without showing them the scenario. Oh, yeah. You have to show them and the that, scenario. Right. That's the key. You have to show them the scenario. One thing you don't want to get are phone calls after the fact. You know, mm -hmm. why did you sell me this plan? You know, I've had people, we've gone to plan G, they want the plan F back. Mm -hmm. Right. They get a couple bills. Give me my plan F. I don't right. care. Just give me the plan F back. The very first building. Which I, is a, I, I a sign. I had that happen a few months ago where yeah. the lady, I think I, I signed her up in March of last year. I got her from an F to a G because where she moved and the price which was so outrageous i mean it was it was over a hundred dollar difference between her f plan and a g plan that it made it made sense and went over how the deductible worked everything she got that first bill in july she goes what is this and well, this is what we went over of course they, she forgot it. of course right and she yeah. goes i want my f back so they're like okay well, let's do an internal conversion let's get your f plan back and they're still gonna have to pay that because you got it up while you had your plan g but starting july 1st you'll be don't have to worry about it. She was, okay, perfect. Right. And she was fine with paying fifty more dollars a month just because she got one bill for twenty dollars. Right. And I think what you guys are saying it's it's absolutely true, and it's going to take a lot of agents reprogramming themselves because a lot of agents or agencies have taught that price is king, and that's what matters, and that's what everybody cares about and it's just not it's just not and we were taught that if someone doesn't you know if they don't see the math the difference in the f and the g you kind of approach it like well are you stupid do you want to throw away money but that's not the point the point is they sleep better at night knowing that they don't get another bill in the mail or okay even if they have the plan g they expect some bills well they may see a bill that they don't agree that they should have gotten billed for and then that just makes for uh heartache for them and then for you because they're calling you as an agent and it doesn't just um you know go smoothly and uh, but again it goes back to there's so many other things other than price and you have to be okay with that and and, real, and, and understand right asking the question what what is important to you, right? Is it your peace of mind or is your wallet or what is it? And listen to them and not just assume that everybody's desire is the same. Can you do a March look up for me? Uh, yeah, I'll be right back. Well, oh. you know, at some point, you know, it's all going to be plan G moving forward. Um, and our plan that people are slowly dying off, but as is, is still available um, and people are used to it. I don't try to talk them out of it. I, I present the facts and, you know, just try to, okay, here's the deal. Because if opposite side of the coin, you know, they could have bought a plan F, you're talking plan F, going back in the day, that's all we sold. And, 
you know, um, come to find out they canceled because somebody pitched them on a plan G or a plan N. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it saved me so much. Yeah, the guy sold me a plan N. Do you know what the plan N does? You okay. know, and then you explain it to him. Oh, he didn't tell me that. Didn't Good luck I? with your visit to MD yeah. Anderson. <clears throat> and, well, I'll keep it for a little while, but normally we'll be able to pull them back into the fold. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a matter of explaining everything. We want them to understand what they're buying, oh. you know. And you have to be okay with their reasoning for going from one to the other. Everybody's different. And when I hear people go, oh, it's about price, it's about price, it's about price. Um, no, that's not the way people work. It's just not. And if you tell me that it's all about price, then what you're telling me, like in other aspects of life, that's like saying only looks matter in relationships. Right? That's it. Only looks. And it's just You'll not the case. You're setting yourself up for a bunch of heartache right. <laughs> and trouble. Well, I mean, think about that. If it was only looks that matter, um, there would only be like three or four people that ever got to hook up with anyone ever. Because it'd be like, no, the best looks humanly possible. Well, I'm sorry. We're all, okay. You know, that's in that. I, I can attest that is not the case because I'm not the most attractive person on the face of the planet. Not bad looking, but someone's actually spent time with me, right? I mean, we all know this is not the case. Price is not it. And by the way, I, I mean, you've heard training. You've had the training yourself where they're like, when it comes to things that are really important, like getting excess charges covered. And the problem is that to, in order to justify that really lazy stance of it's all about price, they'll make shit up. Well, you know, you only encounter like exit charges in 3%. What are you talking about? Excess charges are all over the place for major things. And you have to listen to them too, because if they're in, in a G or an F and they're considering it and to save themselves some money, if they mention that they had bouts of cancer before, that should be like, whoa, 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 no. Because I've had people call and say, you know what, I've done my own research and I want to do that plan. And and you ask her ask them about their health and like, yeah, I've had cancer, little bouts of cancer like three times. I'm cancer free now and I'm healthy and I want to, I want a more, now that I'm healthy, I want to plan in because I hear that's for healthier people. Mm, well, let me tell you and then yeah. see if you still feel the same way about it. So I didn't know double plan and be better off for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, that's um, usually when you go down and cover, you're assuming more risk. Anytime you're going cheaper, there's more pain involved. Right. I, you know, my wife is extremely frugal. You know, she bought a car and she didn't get some of the goodies on it. And we're taking a road trip and the sun was coming in. I go to flip the visor over it and it doesn't extend. Oh, that that was another $200 to get that, you know. <laughs> so for the next three years, we're dealing with this. You know, there were, <laughs> yes. Well, then I mean, that's the shade. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, there, there was always more pain in, in some respect. And, and how much pain are you willing to handle for less money per month? You know, they have to understand what the ramifications are. Are you okay getting 15% of a bill in the hospital that's open-ended, that you might be in there for a month and the bill might be a million dollars? Are you okay? I mean, that's gonna save you $20 a month, but are you okay with that? You know, uh, it's better to keep them in, in a plan that they're already in when they have all the facts than to sway them or let them do something and move themselves into a plan in. And God forbid they experience those excess charges with a MP Anderson situation and they come back to you and they're like, why didn't you? You know, that's way worse than just just let's just not do a sale for the sake of a sale. Let's do the right thing for the client. What amazes me, because we teach this here, and I'm amazed that they don't teach it, is that people, even agents selling this stuff, don't know what an excess charge is, mm -hmm. right? They just don't know what an excess charge is, and they go, well, it's very rare. Well, who says it rare? The guy selling the in plan? I mean, first off, yes, family practitioners that are only charging like $120 for a visit anyway, they're not going to be charging excess charges because the cost to maintain a billing department is going to be more than the 15% overcharge they're allowed to do on a hundred dollar transaction. Fine. But major services that every senior is going to go through at least once in their life for prolonged treatments, cancer, dialysis, you know, heart catheterizations, you know, all of these things, ablations, you're going to specialist. 
and those are really expensive items. And 15% over a $10,000 bill, $40,000 bill, or $100,000 bill is worth hiring Gladys in the back office because you're doing those every day. So when they say, oh, it's only a small, no, it's not. First off, you don't have that data. Secondly, let's look at who charges excess charges, uh, cancer treatment centers, uh, dialysis centers, uh, MD Anderson, the high end, the places where like, if I get prostate cancer and I go to a regular hospital, I might have 70% chance of full recovery. I go to MD Anderson, it's 96% chance. I'll be absolutely fine. If it didn't cost me anything, I'm going to MD Anderson. Right. And right. And don't use stats to sway them one way and then not, you know, give them all the information about the stats, which is oh, you want to go with a supplement because what, 98% of the hospitals and 93% of doctors take care. it. But then, oh, don't worry about the planet. Only 3% of people in the U.S. charge excess charges. Well, that 3% actually, it's more important than you think. Well, it's yeah. huge because <laughs> that's the things that cost for that's the things that cost a lot of money that you will hit. Yeah. But my my point is is this is that as an as an agent and a Medicare specialist, I should be able to look at someone and go, well, if you're really looking for budget, let's talk about a high deductible G plan because I get to mitigate that risk. You capped out at you know the two thousand what is it two thousand twenty four ninety twenty four ninety now right? So it's called twenty five hundred. You're capped out twenty five hundred. <laughs> An excess charge, there's no cap on them unless you get that. And by the way, in plans, because they're not that popular as they used to be, because guess what? People found out what excess charges are. There are in plans out there from the same carrier that are more expensive than their G plan, let alone their high deductible G. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not comfortable for an extra $100 or what, $150 of the difference in the commission I'm gonna get from a high deductible G to a in-plan to give me less coverage in my view. I'm not comfortable just going, okay, I'll do that because it's easy. No, either I'm gonna sell you a G plan or an F plan if you qualify or a high deductible G plan because that middle ground has that giant hole in there. And if my mom got on that, which I got a family history of cancer, she's gonna get hit with that. I'm, I wouldn't be cool with that. I would not be cool with that. So, I mean, if you demand to me, go, I want the implant. I'm going to tell you, I don't agree with it. I'm going to sign you up. Not my problem when it happens. I'll try to help you fix it. But I, you're, I'm going to be on record. I'm going to be on a recorded call saying, hey, man, there's a big hole here. I'll do it. And you know what? You're going to call me back and go, I'm thinking about it. And can you fix it? you got to kind of look at it as if you had to face these people. So, for example, I have another aunt who's going to be turning 65 at the end of the year. She has a history of cancer. Luckily, she's been able to have it removed and this and that. And she's already talking about, oh, you know, I, I want to talk to you later on in the year and about the different plans and this and that. If I recommended a plan into that woman and so she got cancer again, I couldn't look at her in the face, um, you know, and that's kind of how you have to look at it, you know, or yeah, well, let's say I'm a little premium wise, but really what are you exposing them to? And you know it, and you know you are. Why would you do that to, to anybody else? And if it was about premium, you just wouldn't get anything. Mm -hmm. So not to play devil's advocate here. Oh my God, you're gonna play devil's advocate. I have an appointment in 30 minutes for a plan in. <laughs> But, but if they it's, have because they're they're in, they chose? it's because they're in Pennsylvania. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so Ohio, Pennsylvania, a couple other states. Yes. Yeah. All right. But for, for her, we had that exact same conversation mm -hmm. because she was bringing it up. Do you need OK, one second. Um, I originally brought up the plan G for her mom. And she was doing it into it. I go, look, we have an option for a plan N2. It's, I don't recommend it, but we can explore it if you want to. So she was like, okay. And so we talked about the plan G and she looked at the price for the plan in. and she goes, okay, can you just explain to me why you don't really recommend a plan in that often? And I go, I'm not preset to do a plan G, but it's just like Frank said, I, I use the cap as kind of the, mm -hmm. the loss, the fear there is there's no end to what they can charge you for an extra charge. You're only gonna pay 233, your deductible, maybe a copay here or there, but there's no limit to what they can do to where you can have a million dollar excess charge. You don't have $150,000 on hand 
to pay for it. That's why, and I told her too, I go, look, that's why I didn't bring it up because that is never on the forefront of my mind. Right. Except in this particular situation, since your mom is in a state where there are no excess charges, this will work for her. But I told her, make sure she never leaves that state for the rest of her life. I was or gonna say, gets any care right. outside of that state. Uh, you see, and that's the thing you should ask. Yeah. You ask the question, go, will she ever be outside of that state or will she ever seek care outside of that state uh, and that's what i told her i go look if she goes to she can go to philadelphia but if she goes to baltimore if there's an md anderson or anywhere treatment or hoboken maryland or west virginia anywhere because she can go north to New York, she's fine but if she goes to any of these places there is a risk and she goes Anything we have done, we're just going to do it in Pennsylvania. But okay. you want, you want free will there. I said, okay, perfect. Then that, that, that can fit. That, that is going to work for her. Right. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get her her plan in. So that's. But by the way, that's you being a good agent because you're not being dismissive of what their concern is by pulling out a BS statistic or number. Yeah, I didn't say three percent of people. I hate numbers. First off, that's a that's not a real thing. I'm a people person. That's a, a person. that is a that is a BS stat that was relayed over, and now it's become like, well, you know, it's what I heard, and I heard it three days over. Some guy just said, "Ah, he just pulled out of his ass one day." That's what happened. Um, and then look at monthly premiums. You know, that's why people get sucked into a lot of zero premium plans out there. You know, they they're looking at, oh, what can I do with all this extra money per month? And they're not realizing the ramification on the other end. You know. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's scary stuff. I had a client, <laughs> and this still blows my mind to this day, husband had a plan F and had to go to Mayo Clinic. Well, Mayo Clinic makes you sign a paper up front, we're gonna charge excess charges. Mm -hmm. They gave them a check for $8,000, and this was years ago, and I'm like, what? You need to get your money back. The insurance company paid that eight thousand plus you gave them a, a check for eight thousand and they're like well it was a long time ago we're just gonna nope. let it go i'm like no you gotta fight you know go get it that is wrong that is called medicare fraud mm -hmm. <clears throat> and unfortunately that happens more often than not that's why our premiums are so high that's why florida rates are so high is the incidence of medicare fraud out there and um we try to educate people with that, you know, tell them, look, spend the 233, that's it. You know, unless it's something Medicare doesn't cover, you're not responsible for that. There's something wrong. You know, we need to but look into it. But you're giving them that knowledge. So hopefully they, they would be able to say, you know what? No, because my agent Brad told me it's this and that's oh, it. Yeah. That you're empowering that Oh, person. yeah, and I have clients call me. Yeah, I told them just what you told me. And, they, yeah, they resubmitted it to Medicare with the right code, and I didn't have to pay it. Yep. And I will hop on the phone with my client and that billing office, oh, yeah. and I will have that fight for them with them there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, on the G, yeah. especially, I will make, make them feel empowered, like, and, and just keep in mind, it stops at 233 that's it and if you ever think you've gotten billed for more than that you're mm -hmm. the, the source of it is usually the billing and the coding so you that's the course of action is contact them and if you still don't agree then contact me you contact medicare and but this is and i said just sometimes you know these people don't know what they're talking about but you do you do and you can feel confident knowing to you know to challenge that that's why we explain the plans go through a and b and you, you let them know what the plan covers yeah i've had clients who they call me except and nothing to tell me except hey victoria i want to let you know uh, i got a bill for such and such and i called and i told them i said this is over my deductible and they need to re-look at it and they said sure enough that yep you were right and i just, I just want to tell you that that's they worked and i said there you go and they love you for it and a lot of, you know, I'll get them on the phone with the insurance company with data service, and lo and behold, oh, it's already been paid for. Mm -hmm. And they're just trying to double dip, you know. Or here's that, this is what happens a lot too. They'll send out that preparatory explanation of benefit before they start billing anything. And it's just, it's just explaining. It's like a bill. Yeah. Even though it says, this is not a bill. Not a bill. Sometimes it's like, has the faded watermark. It says, not a bill. Right, EOB. But... People will call in. And by the way, this is this is a tip for everyone out there. You get a client calling back saying, I got this weird bill and I'm on a Medicare supplement plan. 
check and see if it's an EOB first before you start digging. Always ask that first. Do you see where it says this is not a bill or if it says explanation of benefit? It'll save you a lot of time. Um, but the once that happens, I mean, if a customer, if you've done your job right and you deliver on your promises, they know that they haven't bought an insurance policy. They bought you and then they're going to use you and then they're going to send more people to you. They're going to stay with you a lot longer. They will never leave. No one calling and offering a free plan is going to take it away from you because um, they don't give a damn about the insurance. They give a damn about the, you're the one that does it for them. They bought a resource that they can trust. I am an asset to all of my clients, not a commodity to be traded. The insurance policy is a commodity to be traded. I'm an asset. I get you those things. We have won a lot of deals because other agents didn't respond or didn't help them. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy sold me this thing. I tried to call him. I could never get a hold of him. Can you help me with this? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. He answered my question and he kind of didn't sound very confident about the answer he gave me. And or they don't help, you know, they, they don't care. Yeah, that's called the insurance company. And, you, know, you know, you have to go the extra mile. Yeah. And by the way, you always hear, you hear agents outside, they go, well, I just don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. And Brad, bottom line is, how Brad makes time. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Brad does over 600 policies a year and he has time. So I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. That's you know, 150, 200 policies a year and you don't have time. Yeah. Come that's on. Exactly, that's like what runs through my head when I think about, gosh, what's going to happen when I start, you know, a couple of years here under my belt and I have all this clientele, I'm like, well, Brad does it. He figures it out. So I guess I'll have, I can figure it out. Too. Number one, sell a lot of supplement right. because lots of supplements, they don't have any issues really, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's just, it's just a matter of priorities and getting your stuff together. I mean, and also not getting in the situation where you're causing longer term problems. I mean, we, we were talking about the, the plan end thing the other day and you're like, well, we never heard anything back. I go, of course you didn't hear anything back because your clients don't like you so anymore. They don't want to know, <laughs> about, you. know about you. And they called a guy like me and I got him switched over. So you just never hear about yeah. it. You probably the money just stops coming. About that Steve and Victoria that put me in the plan end. But you know what? We were trained that that 3% is negligible, that it's that nobody should be worrying about that. And that's and we didn't know any better because that's that's all we knew. I, I completely understand. It's not y'all's fault. Mm -hmm. It's not for y'all's fault. I won't go into who trained you like that and say the organization, but we all know who. Mm -hmm. But now that we know better, we do better. Well, yeah. yeah We're like the, we well, have had clients get five figure bills. Who said that? It was like the it's like the New York MTA, the uh, mass transit see something, oh, say something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's just, it's just it. But that's the. You know, and you're better off with a plan D than a plan N because you're not getting it with the 20 bucks. But it depends on the premiums. But anyway, if I'm looking at someone that wants a, a plan N that's not in a state that has the exemption for it and will never travel, um, I'm looking at high deductible G. You know, I, that, that's. Yeah, yeah, you'll have to pay more out of pocket a little bit every year, but the, the bottom line is you'll never, when that big thing happens, you won't get hit with the massive retirement breaking, crippling yeah, cost. I mean, people that are healthy get those plans and the rates stay very, very stable. We had plans we sold a decade ago, they're, they went up about 10 or $15 a month. On a high deductible G. I yeah, mean, it's insane. Really, yeah, I mean, some of those Slaco plans and they, yeah, I mean, they stay very, very stable because the risk pool is clean. People that buy them are healthy mm -hmm. and they know they're healthy. And, you know, if they do get hospitalized, when you do the math on it, they get hospitalized once every five years. I mean, you made out like a bandit on the net savings. Yeah. And, that, and that's the other thing, too. I mean, I can understand some agents going, well, I'd rather go with X company instead of Y company because you can make a justification. Like mentally, if a company isn't comping well on a certain plan, right? You know that not a lot of agents are signing up people with it because of that. Therefore, you know the risk pool is not going to be strong. You can make that mental connection on there. Mm -hmm. However, if if you are sitting there and you go, okay, well, for this one, for a dollar or two more a month for premium, they go, okay, I can 
And in five years, it's probably going to be a lot less than this one over here because I can tell this was going to be. That's one thing. But if you're sitting there as an agent, as a professional, someone who is licensed and certified and really should be operating not in the company's best interest, but the client's best interest, and you turn around and go, man, I don't want to do this plan because I'll make, I'll make like an extra hundred bucks on that plan level. Dude, what are you in this for? You're in this for the wrong reasons. Right. I mean, you need to watch out for your client and long term for your client, not just the immediate stuff. You know, paybacks I mean, are huge. You'll get referrals. You know, it's a, it's a money making machine. We know how hard it is to get leads and, and everything else. And referral is, boy, instant touch factor. I mean, that's a sale. Yeah, people Usually. love to brag about the great service they got to their friends and the great plan they got and how Zoe took such good care of them. You know, and people will hear that and want to know, well, how do I get that? So. Oh, yeah. They're not afraid. You know, people are referring you. Um, their name is on the line, too. Oh, yeah. So you better do a good job. Friendships have ended off of bad referrals. Yeah, you got to be careful. <laughs> you look at what you sold the person that referred them. Okay, I got them with that. And, uh, probably should get them with that and the two. Otherwise, that person's going to be calling you back. And, How come you got them mutual of Walmart? I can mm. You know, so you have to be careful. I know a lot of times I get referrals that people are in trouble and they just need help. How do I get out of this? Yeah. You know, we can't do anything for them, but we can tell them how to get out of it and, and get the help they need. And, you know, that, that's just what we do. You know? That's what we do. Here's the thing. I mean, I, I see this a lot, too, because there's a lot of folks out there that do coaching on this stuff and, and show their examples. And there's been a, such a deficit of any like, real training or real understanding of these concepts because now they're like generations old. So new people don't know why they work. So they kind of degrade. It's like that old movie, Multiplicity, where you make a copy of a copy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so people have those things and they, and they go, uh, they just go, ah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll shortcut it now, mm -hmm. right? And it just ends up being this weird Frankenstein. So they don't see the results. And the problem is, is that because they're going, and you hear it all the time, they shortcut everything. They'll go like, as soon as someone calls in or as soon as they, Hey, I'm here to save you money on this. No, right? But when we keep it open, like we have people call in and every other, like even our lead providers, they've, I've had them hear me do stuff, right? And they'll go, wait, why aren't you just qualifying them immediately? We'll see where it goes. Watch my closing percentage. That's why. And your oh, my percentage. Right. Mm -hmm. And my churn percentage is very low. My closing percentage is very high. I know you want me to buy more leads from you. But uh, when they get on the phone with me, it's not a, hey, do you want to do this? And then we have a conversation and say, hey, what's going on? How can I help you? What do you want? What are we doing? I don't care what it is. The funnel is very wide. I want to get into a conversation. That's my only goal right now. Get into a conversation, see what opportunities. Well, that's the advantage of working here is typically what people want is what we can provide for them. Right. There's never been a, we can't do that unless it's like some medical qualification that they fail you know but anything well, i want I want barrel or i want to deviate like we have all these different resources i've had customers call me up they are customers now they called me up because they thought i could help them find a medical a medical marijuana dispensary and you know what i did i got on i said i am not a doctor i am not this i am an insurance guy but tell you what let's find out i right? got a guy yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Google, it's wonderful. And then we get into a conversation about their insurance. Yeah. And then we get them set up on there. You get supplements. Oh, and you want to talk about referrals? I go that extra mile. Everyone else says there. No, I don't do that. Bye. Well, congratulations. Good luck on calling another hundred people to get a hold of somebody. I'm on the phone with a human being. That's the hardest thing. That is one of the biggest determining factors on whether you're going to have sex uh, success or not, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have success or not, it's going to be based off of uh, what? You had a Freudian slip. I did? Yeah. Whether you're not going to have sex or not. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, this applies to the same thing on both then. Um, contact rate. Yeah. Contact rate. Yeah. Contact rate is absolutely important. 
I don't care how many calls you make if no one picks up the phone. If you don't have an opportunity for a conversation, you can't make a sale. Mm -hmm. Contact rate, contact rate, contact rate. Someone's on the phone with me. I have succeeded in the first step. Yeah. Let's make it count. That's it. So I just the, the hurry, the speed that people want to get off the phone with potential clients, mm -hmm. the fact that guys and agents, they pigeonhole themselves into selling only one company or one product. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. You can They'll be an expert. With you longer if you can do everything for them. You know, it, it stinks when you can sell the stuff and they're like, oh, how about life insurance? Oh, no, I can't help you there. You know, it's nice when you're a one stop shop and you, they really feel taken care of in all ways. Well, and also to capitalize off the Freudian slip earlier, mm -hmm. relationships. We're, we're developing a relationship with another human being. How honestly, I want to get y'all's perspective on this. From <laughs> well, I just had a great one. I'll, I'll pitch in. <laughs> how, how sustainable or long term or how much is a guy going to get out of a relationship if you like you're going to go? You're like, hey, can you help out with this? And he goes, no, I only mow lawns. She'll find somebody. I only mow lawns. That's all I do. Right. She'll find somebody who will. Or yeah. may not even be looking and stumble upon someone else. Right. That's it. I only mow lawns. I don't help out with the laundry. I don't help out doing anything nope. else. I just mow the lawn. That's my jam. That's all I, I do. Feelings. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, nope. Don't want to hear about your day. Mow lawns. Mm -hmm. You know, all that stuff. And then you're not even going to get into a relationship. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, might yeah. because of your looks, but uh, yeah. Then, yeah. but we've already established that looks don't matter yeah, because been I've thing. been married. That means someone compromised. <laughs> okay. So that's the point, which is, if that's what you're going for, you think that's what you should go for, then you will be sorely mistaken. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know who really goes for that? Children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People that are like, oh man, when I'm young, I'm gonna have a supermodel wife, and I'm gonna have this, and I have this, and I'm a Ferrari, and I'm like, man, reality. Ooh, it hits us all pretty hard. You'll get there. Um, and then you'll realize that those things that Sometimes you thought were really important really aren't. Wish for. Yeah. That's gonna be the worst thing. Man, I, I have seen look at look at look at celebrities. The most beautiful people marrying the most beautiful people and leading the most Allie miserable Mary, lives. She's a man because they treat her like crap. Well, that's what she's looking for. Mm -hmm. She might not conceptualize it or might not realize it, but you you made a choice. Or she might be the crazy one. I don't make that call. I don't make that call. When relationships, people make choices, right? But not everyone is that good alive for a long time. Like me, can't keep it up. I really want to help people, and I end up being an enabler in some of my stuff. And I have a problem with that. I work on it, but at the same time, I met a lot of people that end up being very lonely and very poor because their inability to mature. We've seen them. And by the way, we all looked amazing when we were 21 years old. Just amazing. I'm 40 now. <laughs> 21 year old Frank would have looked at him and go, What have you done to me? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because, you know, the values change. We mature, we get older. You know, it's, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. I have healthier relationships and a healthier career than I would have ever imagined at my young age. So. I just had a good call. I say good call because you're here, you're talking about relationships and what, what we're doing here, trying to build relationships. So I didn't sell her anything and she absolutely did not want to change or anything. And she doesn't want to be greedy. If she doesn't need those benefits, she doesn't need them, et cetera, et cetera. But we just talked for a while and I said, Oh, no, you don't have to change anything. That's fine. Do you have any questions about what you have now? And I, you know, just kind of went through some things and it ended up being a 45 minute conversation. And I not only am going to have her, but her aunt in October when the new plans come out, there's no reason for her to change. She's happy. Everything's working. And, uh, they're not, there's no new plans from <laughs> what she has now. She wants to stay with the company she's with and there's no new plans until October. I said, just don't even call the other one. I mean, don't pick up the phone or just tell them to get off the list. You have somebody and I mean, she made sure I texted it to her. She wrote it down. She said, I'm gonna put your name as soon as this text comes, I'm gonna put your name on that. I mean, she wanted to talk. I mean, she was a very happy lady Wonderful. at the end of that. And I'll, not only she's going to have her aunt come over and they're going to both work with me on Great. Maybe no so, so today doesn't mean not Yeah, it doesn't mean. Down, move, yeah. yeah. And she was just so sweet. And she was just telling me, you know, you have lifted a weight off my heart. I 
feel so much better. I'm so glad I answered the phone. You know, it was a whole, you know, um, different person at the end of the call than how we started. Um, and all I did was basically just be a good listener and listen to what was going on in her world and her life and, you know. So Brandon talks about this a lot and he's, he's very right about it, which is the, and sometimes people misinterpret what he, he's, he's can sometimes be saying with it, or at least I take it a different way than a lot of people do. And that is you should have consistency and do things the same way. Right. And for me, that is, if you tell me you're not going to buy right now, why am I going to change what I'm going to do for you? Right. I should do that for every single person because I do a really good job and eventually I'm going to get you. I'm not going to lose in this scenario. You know, I'm going to where else are you going to go? Yeah. Who else is going to take care of you like me? Right. Eventually, something's going to happen with your current plan. Something's going to I'll be the guy there. So, ever, so by not going, well, you know, if you, whenever you're ready to switch, call me. No, man, we're going to do the work now. Yeah. Let's do it. i got to yeah. prove my value. Let's go. Yeah. And we did. We went over her plan, what she has. And I answered questions about what she has and, you know, benefits on her plan she had not yet accessed and things like that. Did you bring um, I didn't. Oh. I thought about it. I thought about it, but I'm like, I, I was afraid I was pushing my limit there. But anyway, we got way farther into the conversation than I, and she started asking me more and more things and wanting to know more and more. Um, and it was because she felt so comfortable. I know, she, I know about her pets i know <laughs> about how her neighborhood is and people that's coming into the neighborhood and that's love that's trust you know, yeah that's which trust. she says i mean she even said she can she said i can tell the difference there's a difference on people saying they're trying to help you on the phone and somebody that is trying to help you from their heart you know and that's exactly i mean um but she'll get it she you you did the work. Yeah. I'm sure you could have brought it up, yeah. whatever. But right, you engaged that situation. She's probably like, "Oh, I'm glad you're not trying to sell me something," and then you go try to sell her something. I I wasn't obviously on the conversation, right? Yeah. If when you speak to her in October, she'll you get it if you bring it up, and she yeah. doesn't have one, you'll get it. Yeah. Timing isn't everything. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. I thought about though. I did think about it. I love because it doesn't <laughs> hurt you. It right. doesn't hurt you, but right. at the same time. You don't want to thought about it. At least you're thinking about it. Right. Right. And that's fine. Uh, but at the same time, I'm focusing on the good, which is there's so many people that want everyone to be so hyper transactional because they don't actually do what we do. We talk about it a lot. Coach about it a lot. They talk about it and all this other stuff, but they don't actually do it. And there's constantly this, this, this divorcing of what really money generating or revenue generating activity really is. Yeah. And yeah. because of that, I mean, all the little slogans, always be closing ABC. I use this clothes. I use this clothes. You got heart clothes. Right. It's feel felt found. Oh my God. I hate that so much. Yeah. Right. All but these things. Like, care, like giving a crap about them. Well, yeah. Maybe. Or just not caring about the outcome yet. Right. Just care about them and what they're going through, what they're dealing with. And then, you know. Yeah, I mean, most of these seniors know all the closes already. Right. They <laughs> right. got I mean, you know, they've all heard them so many times and they know what they're what you're trying to accomplish. You know, so, I mean. You shouldn't have to close. You, that's right. You shouldn't have to close. It should be an organic transition. You, you should, should be done. hearing, how do I, how can, I don't how get, do it. get this done? How, how do I, I get it? What I need to do right. next? I what I need to do next? Yeah. Okay, how do we get this? Yeah. Let's get it done. That's why when, and that's, when, yeah, I mean, that's where you need to be. Yeah. yeah. That's why the response of when people, uh, you call people and they answer the phone and they bark at you saying, I don't want to buy anything. And you put them on their back and say, well, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just, you know, they, that will like throw yeah. them off 
and put the, or, know, okay, that's fine. What do you want? Those are the, you know why they say that? Because they know they're a pushover. Right. Everybody that says that, you know, they, right. they buy everything. So, okay, I mean, give, the, give, give, give the people, give the people watching a little bit of your background, <laughs> where you came from and how you know that is true. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I sold remodeling in homes for seven years, and we get these leads, and some of these, they send you out to these homes. And I had one lady, and this, not just one, but... Right away, I pull up. She's running out to the car. I told the guy on the phone, I'm not buying anything. Great. Yeah, but I'm not here to sell you anything. Next thing you know, and 20 minutes later, she's buying a house full of windows. Mm -hmm. So it's like those people, that's a defense mechanism because they know. And salespeople are usually the worst ones with that because... <laughs> I like to buy stuff. Oh, you know, love it. I am a pushover. When it, in fact, I know what I want. I'm, I'm like, I, I don't want a present. Let's just, after this. Let me just buy it. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> right? a, it's super right. easy. And those are the type of people I know I'm not buying. That's just a defense mechanism saying, yeah. I know I'm going to have to buy this and I can't afford it and I don't want to talk to you and I don't want to go through that. But once you explain the value, you you know, and that's really what it's all about, the value. You have to you have to develop and build value. And once they see that, it's like, okay, man, let's let's get it done. I remember you telling me years ago when you first started here, you know, everyone shares some war stories, right? right? He used to work in Chicago, uh, and he would go one of the jobs you had was going to businesses and well, so you know, I was B2B. I, I, I sold industrial equipment for about twenty five years warehouse equipment, forklift trucks, and I'd be knocking on doors, and I found out that going in the front door is not the way to do it, you know, especially in the summertime, because you've got a screener there, you know, okay, blah, 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 you're never going to get through and give them some information. So what I would do, I would go to the place next door, and I'd say, um, yeah, you know, i just walk in the back door to the floating dock. Yeah, I'm here to see uh, Bill Smith. Oh. Yeah, well, he's next door. Oh, oh wow, you guys have little trucks here? You know, who's the guy I talked to? You know, next thing you know, I'm talking to the president of the company. Right. They're leading me in through the back door, you know, and, and you just have to be, use tact sometimes. I mean, you just have yeah. to think about, you're going to get these roadblocks. These walls will come up. How do you break down the walls? You know, and also, don't pay attention to a no solicitation sign because they buy stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the one. Oh yeah, that's oh, the guy that has. That's the guy that buys right there. We always, every place has those signs. We've got one here. No, we took it down. Oh, did we? Yeah, we took yeah, it I was down. Like, why do we have that? I mean, it's, it's antithetical. We sell stuff, man. We can't. Yeah. No, give each. You got to I can't let you in the office. Back. I mean, okay, we have a conference right. room right here. Can't let you onto that sales floor. But we got a conference room right here, and if what you got's worth it, we'll give you the time on it. It's not an invitation to come out here, but you know, you got to respect the trade. I mean, and you have to realize your value. You know, one of my favorite sales posters goes back. You know, the, this guy's about ready to fight a war. You know, he's got all the men out there with swords, and he's in the tent. He's figuring things out, and there's a guy, salesman. At the other side of the tent, sir, oh, there's somebody here to see. I can't see him right now. You know, I got a war to fight. The guy's out there with a Gatling gun. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, we know what we're, we're a value. You know, we know we can help the people. We can put them in a better situation. We know we can do that. We have to believe we, we can do that. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. You have to believe Absolutely. in yourself and believe what you're doing. Believe what you're selling is a value and you can help them and put them in a better situation. That's step one. But then the greater challenge is convincing them that you're a value. Mm -hmm. right. and, and how do you do that? You know, you start with building the relationship and building the trust. Somebody that they want to talk to, that they will welcome you in anytime. You can call them anytime, you know, and, and that's that's, you know, really the crux of it right there. They don't care what you're selling. If they like you, they're going to buy from you. Right. You know? Make a friend, make a sale. That's it. You know? That's it. You know, I can remember calling when I was calling on businesses. They'd be busy. They're always busy. 
you know, and, and especially now, I mean, they've gotten rid of all the other things as long lunches are gone, everything else. But when you know you have a good relationship when you call on the door unannounced and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, bring them in, you know. Right. And they just yeah. want to talk to you for a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got that. I'll bring them in, mm -hmm. you know. You know, when I was doing, when I was doing sales, I was doing international sales, I would call a client list. And they're like, why aren't you closing it? Oh, this isn't that call. <laughs> this is to this is build a relationship on the account yeah, side. Let's go. Exactly. Um, I mean, and people would always look at it. Well, that's a waste of time. Wait till the end of the quarter. Yeah. Just well, wait. I can't tell you how many times in kind of the beginning of the call, saying who I am and who I work for. By the end of the call, they bought, and they've been saying my name throughout the phone call. And they're like, oh, yeah, and by the way, who did you work for again? It didn't they matter. Care. They don't care. It didn't matter, no. obviously. We put so much time into coming up with catchy names for insurance brokerages and account. It doesn't matter. Right. I mean, really, we're doing that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. it's, no one cares. No one cares about, you know, Stone Bob Lake. No one, right. no one cares about Medicare gurus. No one cares about insurance sales. It's an industry term for identification so we can get paid by insurance carriers. Right? right? Yeah. But no one cares about it. No. Well, that's why when I first came in, I was like, okay, Medicare gurus. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting name. But it doesn't matter. Anyhow, um, I am me, and I that's what matters, you know. I'm, it's me selling it. Right. And when the problems occur and I need someone to be held accountable for it to help me through the bad times, mm -hmm. I can't call a logo. Mm -hmm. I'm calling Victoria. I'm calling Penny. I'm calling Brad. Right. You know, that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, people put a lot of onus on it. I see it in scripting all the time. I mean, you got to really play up the brand. Got to really play up the brand. No, you don't. You absolutely don't. They don't care. They won't even care about the insurance company right. they just bought. They right. don't care. They care about it being you. If you focus on that, you will always win. Because I'm telling you right now, it'll come off as it will. It won't come off as anything. It will be absolutely authentic, absolutely genuine. People respond to that. They don't like people bullshitting them. They don't like slimy salespeople. And we go, ugh, sales. Slimy sales people. <laughs> they suck. Yeah. Well, really, I don't view it as sales. I facilitated a solution for your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Remember when she fought off cancer and she didn't go bankrupt? Yeah. You're welcome. So, what do you have to say about what I do now? <laughs> right. So, it's like community service is kind of almost the way I feel. I mean, you're doing a service for. A portion of the community being all of us in the U.S. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of social worker in all of us, what we do. Yeah. You know, people do get into trouble and they need help and they, they get lost. And um, especially when they try to navigate the complex Medicare and Social Security situations and they get confused and they need somebody that can just tell them, I'll take care of it for you. Mm -hmm. It's off your plate. You know, that's what they're looking for. And by the way, in the business business world, that's all they're buying too. That's all really. They just want it done. And I keep telling everyone this when they came in. You guys have heard me say it a million times because it's the absolute truth. I went from being in the Marine Corps and Air Traffic Controller, high stress and a highly, highly rewarding job is because it has purpose, right? And then I went into sales, 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 and I was a mercenary salesperson. You know, I won't go into the exact statement that I usually use to, to determine that, but yeah, it was like, all right. But when I found this place in particular here, not insurance as a whole, but when I found this office, I came in and I said, so I can make a, a fantastic amount of money. I get paid full renewals. I can build a book of business that will continue to pay on me. Oh, wait. And I'll never have to apologize or explain what I do. <laughs> Okay, so where's my downside? Because right. and there's clients who have nobody in this whole world to care about them, or right. look out for them, and for you to be that for them, I mean, that's worth so much. I and mean, some of these people, even their adult son or daughter, is has no idea. I mean, that they're trying to help their mom or dad or whatever with their Medicare stuff, but they have no idea either. So I mean, they need help. 
they need help to help their mom or dad. <laughs> so, you know, I like being where we can help families because um, that's helping future clients too. I mean, the son or daughter or whoever is helping, they'll be 65 someday, you know, then we have a family aging in. You'd be surprised, you'll find, you'll find quite a few clients where we are now, like me, myself, I'm two generations in. In some cases, considering how the social dynamics of people that were, you know, some of them born in the 30s, you know, you get some of those rural areas back in the 1950s, 1940s, people would get married at like 14 or some insanely low age. Yeah. And then they had kids at like 17. And then those kids had kids. So some of us here that have been doing this for more than 10 years or again, up on 15, we're almost three generations in clients, which is actually, I know I am three generations in because I have a, a uh, mother, a daughter, and then I have a grandson who's on disability. Mm -hmm. I already have one of those. So I'm three generations in on some of these folks. And for me, that just blows my mind. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, how do you get multi-generational loyalty out of a family? That's the kind of crap that, like, kings used to try to get, right? <laughs> well, you do a damn good job, and you care about them. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's going to be a crazy concept. Once I retire, if I ever retire, you know, I'll have three or four generational family clients all on individual policies. It's amazing. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. <laughs> So you can take your customer surveys and your, your customer satisfaction, 90%, well, you whatever. Did, you, did, you did all that without like call metrics and uh, monthly uh, supervisor right. evaluations. Right. You're, that's what you're telling me. Uh, I, I won't say we didn't try them in the past. And I won't say I wasn't subject to them. Sure. I will say they didn't help at all. And it was <laughs> absolute bullshit, the stuff what that we're that being monitored. you to get these multi-generational mm -hmm. deals? No, in fact, I will say that a lot of the things that I've been coached on in the past through other career places, or even as we were growing and developing here, were absolutely unhelpful or harmful to that concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have a, just enough in my threshold from my history and who I am as a person of screw you, I'm going to do it better. Uh, in my in my court to where because I hate losing and by the way if you put me in a position where I'm going to lose I'm going to go I'm not going to do it bye right or I'm going to go I'm not going to do it and just watch me beat you into the ground or just watch me grind those expectations down so I did it and ultimately speaking when those in periods of my life where people go you know what you're doing great you're top of the board um, but you could I look people in the eye and go, okay, well, um, top. Mm -hmm. So maybe what you're training, you should be training what I do. And then I took that and I learned, and I'm really good at taking from other people, right? Not from like the client says, but I'm talking about like sitting around and, and absorbing what other people are doing. Like I can't tell you how much I've learned from just sitting next to Brad over the years. I've learned, from, I've learned a lot from you. <clears throat> you know, I'm honored to work with you guys. Oh, my God. It's been, it's, it's just. It's a community thing. It's a team effort. And we learned from The last 12 other. years with you have been like some of the really the best times of my life. I mean, because you're just constantly learning. But that's the thing is that you can't have ego if you want to learn. You can't. You just can't. You, you're not open to new new things that'll benefit you if you're always defending what you do. Yeah, you have to accept that this is an ever growing, ever changing business right. anyway. It's a practice. And people are that way too. Good call, man. It's a practice. Why is it called a practice? Because you gotta practice. Right. And it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. You know, just like doctors, it's a practice. They don't it's not a, a one and done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a while to figure things out. Things change. I mean it's underwriting stuff changes like the wind. Oh, dude. You know, we have to stay on top of it, you know, and it, we learn as we go. You know, every week I learn something else. It's like, I didn't know that, you know. And I try to write it down, you know, because I'll forget sometimes. But, yeah, and we learn from one another. 
No, so if you come into this saying, oh, no, I know it all, I, I know, you will fail and you'll just be more, so frustrated because you want to hold on to that. And because you. you will see that it's not, you don't Nobody know. Nobody wants all. to know it all. You know, I had a friend of mine who went to go buy a couch. He walks into this place. He says, Yeah. He said, What do you want? I'm looking for a couch. Oh, sorry, sir. We sell sofas. Oh, cool. Sorry, I'm looking for a couch. See you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, yeah. you know, I mean, you, just, you, you can't be, you know, put yourself up on a pedestal. I mean, you're, you're there, at the yeah. same level, right. you know. That's so you, you, you share. I learn a lot from my clients. My gosh. Mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff. If you know, anything learned about tips and, yeah, I mean, just having conversations. I mean, so Jacob's been going on three years here, right? Jacob's he's so wise beyond his years. Oh my God! It's like the, it's I like mean, he, the guy is, he absorbed a sixty-year-old man, yeah. right? He just like <laughs> yeah. all of that. He's not only good technically, but he's also yeah, a fast learner and super wise and I, I gotta tell you and also I mean I've been amazed by the things that he's brought to the table oh yeah like even the new the new way we approach final expense at this company yeah, yeah. I mean that one lead in that one thing who takes care of you things go bad who takes care of you and you have all people who could easily say no I know it all I'm not open to new approaches for you to really take that new technique to heart it's so endearing because you're you're telling you're showing everyone look you should always be learning and you can always be learning yeah absolutely every all right so there's a little thing i learned in my life especially by being a bit of a i didn't have the most stable family environment right so we moved around a lot and i was kind of in different places and i also while i was shy and goofy and buck toothed i was also a bit of a smart ass with a chip on my shoulder Right. So I got my ass kicked a lot growing up mm -hmm. and I learned something very, very quickly. And it was taught to me and it really stuck with me. It's there is no such thing as a fair fight. Someone is always going to be quicker. Someone's always going to be smarter. Someone's always going to be dirtier. Someone's always going to be stronger. It's just never going to be an equal playing field. So you better start learning. You better start practicing. You better start jogging. You better start getting anything you can to equalize it or get one up. And that means you can't be prideful. You can't sit there and go, you know what, but I do it this way. You better evaluate what works. And you better, by the way, you also better recognize people for the great things they bring. They might not think it's a big deal. Like Jacob, he didn't think that was a big deal. He was like, hey, you know, this is one thing. I was like, I listen, I went, that is amazing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Holy crap, dude. Did you like dream that? He's like, well, I'm just trying. like, dude, that's write it down, put it in a book. That's good. And it works. It just as soon as I heard it, I went, that's gonna work like gangbusters. And lo and behold, it does. It immediately changes the perspective of someone from trying to shop for themselves or thinking about something from their own perspective. And you always hear this, well, I don't care, I'll be dead, put me in a folders can, but right to haul oh, there's someone that cares about me and they put themselves out for me and now i know they'll be doing this and i don't want the last memory of the person that i care about the most because they care about me to be like I, I i put an obligation on them that i'll never be able to pay back i hate that all these things run through these people's head off that one thing and if for someone for really like me going you know it's not really it's, it's how you say it so i just checked off all the boxes and this guy who's not even 30 years old just came up with it and it was so well thought out. Of course, I'm going to use it. Of course, I'm going to at least try it out. I said, I'm going to at least try it out. And it has not failed since. But how many CEOs or VPs would admit that they learned something from some 30 year old kid? I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. What these other guys do doesn't matter. To That's my point is you you can't look at it that way. You can't be closed minded and uh, and have so much pride that you know you're not learning anymore. You have to admit that you have to learn things and you do learn things and you can learn things. Let's face it, salespeople have big egos. Mm -hmm. It's part of it's yeah, part of what we are, you know. Well, and great salespeople can be competitive, but the ego needs to drop real quick. Yeah. You have to learn how to keep it in check. Mm -hmm. Or get rid of it. Yeah. I mean, even we, hey, I've known some really great leaders. Right? And that's what sales is, is leadership. So I'm leading people to a solution that benefits them in life. Right. And if you don't, if it doesn't benefit them in life, you shouldn't be selling it. You should never sell something you don't believe in.
because then you're just a damn liar. Right. Um, I mean, that's it. But I mean, most leaders, great leaders, they don't have egos. It's servant leadership. Mm -hmm. People will follow you because you will follow and put out for them. You will put out for them and they will put out for you. That's the contract that's out there. Put the effort in for my clients. They'll reward me by being my clients. So this whole concept of people wanting to be, you know, just this, this, this weird thing where everyone wants to be the source of every answer. Everyone wants credit for shit. That's not what it's about. What it's about is success and not losing, not losing clients, not losing mm -hmm. great employees and coworkers, yeah. not losing teammates, not losing the, the, you lose battles, don't lose the war, right? By not losing, I will win by default, give it enough time and scale. So what does it matter if who gets credit? Well, on that build note, yourself you up to... and build everybody else up around you. You're not losing anything by bringing everybody up. Uh, uh, Neil, yeah. I'm filling in right now because the guy who usually does this and does a better job at this than I do is sick. I don't care if anyone knows my name, right? It, it's not it's not supposed to be that way no one's gonna it shouldn't be about like a personality it shouldn't be about a concept my idea shouldn't win out and that's why it's better it just shouldn't work and some of the greatest things that have helped humanity and greatest concepts of time they're unattributed we don't know where they came from they've been requoted so many times we forgot who came up with them but we didn't forget the concept and that's what's mad that what really matters so if a if five years from now i was able to help someone out and they could make it their own and then take that and then that becomes their thing that they can pass on well, i care i became a millionaire by helping people Ooh. what what up i don't need a trophy you know I don't, I'm not one of those guys that needs, oh, I need a medal. I need a trophy. Yeah. I need, I need people clap for me. No, became a millionaire and I got to help people. Awesome. I'm winning. I will hop in my car and go to my nice house and take my nice vacations and reward myself. The adulation isn't there. I don't, and also I don't have kids. I don't need to make anyone proud. You know, never going to have that. Or, huh? My mom loves me and was proud of me. Actually, I say, even to this day, she likes the fact that I help people. My mom's a nurse. She also works at the VA, which I also use the VA. My mom, to this day, says, I was as proud as I could be uh, of you when you graduated boot camp. She said, you know, because I, that was it. I knew you didn't have to. She goes, I knew you didn't have to do that. You wanted to do that, and you were doing it for reasons other than what most people have to. And you did it. You accomplished it. That's it. I couldn't be more proud of you at that point, and I've never been less proud of you since. And I'm cool with that. So, yeah. But anyway, what my mom says was mostly, she's like, I just want you to be happy. I go, well. When I figure out what happy is, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are 117. 117. It looks like my uh, one o'clock uh, interview didn't get a call in, so that's fine. John? I'm going to have to bail. All right, man. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. be wrapping up here shortly, but John, thanks for coming in. I wanted to check in with you, man. How are you doing? Hey, everybody, this is John. He's new to our organization. And, uh, you know, really kind of hopped on the phone full force today. I feel good. Um, it's nice to have available a larger portfolio. You know, I think I think for me having an advantage kind of experience getting the Medigap in in control. You know, really being able to really put that in the percentage it des deserves to be. Um, you know, whether that's 33% and you mix it with some of the ancillary products. You need to talk to me? Or whether it's 50%, right. but, um, you know, having access to these types of, uh, you know, it's it's going to develop me into, you know. Oh yeah, when we get you an abundance of options, mm -hmm. you really can just set yourself up in a position to where you can't lose. And again, one day at a time as I, uh, you know, ramp up or, you know.
I got my friend Ken out there. He needs me for a deal. So, guys, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Um, thanks for watching. If you are watching or if you're watching this later, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you want to know more and you want to use more of our tool, if you want to use more of our tools, learn more about this, uh, go to insuresales.com and sign up for the free insurer link. Uh, 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 media site. Again, it's only for agents and people who are actively selling and producing insurance. We're not interested in recruiters going on there. If you are a recruiter or an FMO or a carrier, don't even bother. Um, I want to hear from salespeople. I want salespeople to share with each other and that way we can all make the world and the industry better and make ourselves better, make our, our successes wider and longer term. So you guys have a wonderful day. Stay safe um, and you know, have fun doing what you're doing. All right, bye.